Intellectual and Manual Labor, a Critique of Epistemology by Alfred Son Ruthel. Uh, this is chapter 15 to chapter 17. So chapter 15, Mathematics, the Dividing Line of Intellectual and Manual Labor. In chapter 13, we illustrated the proto-intellectual character of the mental work in the Bronze Age by describing the Egyptian geometry of the rope. We found it to be a highly efficient and multivariant art of measuring attaining useful and indeed astonishing grades of approximation. But it was in the character of a skill rather than of a science, even though it depended on extensive geometrical interpretation and instruction as indispensable accessories to manual practice. Admittedly, from my perspective, I would not place traditions handed down from the Bronze Age or even earlier on the same level as the mathematics created by the Greeks. They replaced the rope by ruler and compass and thus transformed the previous art of measurement so fundamentally that something completely new grew out of it. Mathematics as we understand it. The geometry of the Greeks is of a purely intellectual character and detached from the practice of measurement. How could the change in the implementation achieve such a difference? Or rather, what transformation occurred to bring this change about? The art of the rope was a manual skill which could only be carried out by those apprenticed to do it and practiced in it and only at the particular spot where the need for measurement arose. Divorced from this, it had no point, neither did it leave behind any detachable demonstration of its geometric content. After each action of measurement, each measure, the rope was moved on from one position to another so that such a thing as a direct geometrical demonstration never came into question. The geometry inherent in the task at hand extinguished itself in the practical result which was only ever applicable to the case in point. To be sure, the harpadinaps harp, uh, in the course of their training had to be taught and shown the constantly recurring elements in their techniques. And with Amis, much of this is presented in the guise of geometric rules. But it must surely be nothing but a reflex of our own conceptions when mathematical historians, including Moritz Cantor, Sir Thomas Heath, and D.F. Smith, conjecture that a theoretical manual must have existed, serving as a foundation to Amis's book of practical exercises, a manual which has never been found. The Greeks, however, invented a new kind of geometric demonstration. Instead of stretching ropes, they drew lines by ruler which remained on the sheet underneath, and together with more straight lines formed a permanent figure from which could be recognized geometric laws. The combination of lines were tied to no particular location, and their size was infinitely variable. The geometry of the measurement thus became something quite different from the measurement itself. The manual operation became subordinated to an act of pure thought which was directed solely towards grasping quantitative laws of number or abstract space. Their conceptual content was independent not only from this or that particular purpose, but from any practical task. In order, however, to detach it from such application, a pure form abstraction had to emerge and be admitted into reflective thought. We reason that this could result only through the generalization intrinsic in the monetary commensuration of commodity values promoted by coinage. It goes without saying that this radical transformation from the Egyptian art of measuring to the geometry of the Greeks did not occur at one stroke, but only over hundreds of years and mediated by incisive developments to the productive forces and by corresponding changes in the relations of production. For proof of this, one need go back no further than to the, to the beginnings of Greek geometry. The invention which bears Thales's name is traditionally connected with the measurement of distance of ships from the coast. Here the art of the rope would clearly have been useless. This one example illustrates the worldwide difference between the Bronze Age, Age mainland economics of Egypt and Mesopotamia <clears throat> based on agrarian exploitation 
and the Greek city-states based on sea voyaging, piracy, and trade. The Greek forms of production were peasant agriculture on a small scale and independent handicrafts. The new moneyed wealth of the Greeks emanated solely from the circulation nexus, an achievement affected, as Lenin says, by merchants and usurers capital. It did not spring, spring from the land or from the workshops of manual producers, at least not before these were replaced by slaves who themselves became the source of commodities for exchange. An essential point regarding the pure mathematics of the Greeks is that it grew to be the unbridgeable dividing line between mental and manual labor. This intellectual significance of mathematics is a central theme with Plato. Euclid, in his Fundamentals of Geometry, created an imperishable monument to it at the threshold of Hellenistic culture. This work seems to have arisen from the sole or for the sole purpose of proving that geometry as a deductive thought structure was committed to nothing but itself. In the synthetic quality of thought, no account was taken of the material interchange of man with nature, either from the point of view of the sources and means involved, nor from that of its purpose or use. Into this glass house of Greek thought went not a single atom of natural matter, quite parallel with commodities and their fetish identity as value. It was the pure formalism of second or paranature and suggests that in antiquity, the form of money as capital, in other words, the functionalism of second nature, finally remained sterile. Although it had indeed freed labor from slavery, it had failed to lower the reproduction cost of human labor power in any noteworthy way, if at all. We can conclude this to be true in retrospect from the fact that development after Euclid by Archimedes, Erastisthenes, Apollonius, the legendary Huron, and many others, in whose mathematical elements of abstract dynamics were already noticeable, consequently achieved technical application limited only to military or other wasteful ends. Chapter 16 Head and Hand in Medieval Peasant and Artisan Production We can sum up by saying that the salient feature of antiquity in our context is that the social category of value as money and as capital, capital operating solely as merchants, usurers, and predatory capital, failed to communicate its social character to labor. Labor was not human labor, it was slave labor, a variant of animal function. Any cooperation performed under the whip of the slave driver ceased when the slaves were freed. As a freed man, the individual dropped out of any cooperation, both the one involved in slavery and also the cooperation within the tribal community to which he belonged before his enslavement. The end result of the ancient forms of commodity production was the final dissolution of the numerous forms of communal production which preceded it or were initially coexistent with it. The description we quoted from Engels to the dissolution of the Athenian Gentile society only exemplifies the process which took place throughout the length and breadth of the Roman Empire until it reached its own dissolution. In fact, ancient commodity production economically fed on the very process of dissolving primitive tribal economies and came to an end of its monetary economy when there were none of these left to dissolve. Rome then became a place inhabited by an atomized mass of about 2 million individuals living on unemployment benefit and social security, as we would say today, to supply them with panem et surcensis, <laughs> food and entertainment, rather than using the payment to organize production, capitalist production, as it would have been. Production was supplied by the enormous latifundia run on slave labor and owned by the senators and equities ruling the empire. As the economy lost its character of a monetary and slave economy, it transformed into feudalism, which represented the final legacy Rome bequeathed to its medieval successors. The negativity of the Roman decline, the disintegration of the ancient formation of commodity production, brought forth a positive result of great importance, the humanization of labor. 
By this I mean that productive labor lost its incompatibility with the human quality of man and could be undertaken without the risk of enslavement. Christianity, with its religious cult of man in the abstract, was a plausible ideological expression of this innovation. The serf and the villain were baptized the same as the feudal lord, and from the very start this religion sought its converts partly among the slaves and the freedmen, but mainly among people of the laboring and the artisan status. The economic development in European feudalism started again with peasant agriculture on a small scale and production of independent artisans, both of which, on the one hand, formed the basis of the feudal mode of production, as they had also formed, the economic foundation of the communists or the communities of classical antiquity at their best, after the primitive oriental system of common ownership of land had disappeared and before slavery had seized on production in earnest. It is almost as though history was making a restart after the communal modes of production had been cleared out of the way and labor freed from slavery. We shall note later how this restart led on to a road which took mankind in a direction diametrically opposed to that of the first start. The advantage that feudalism offered to the humanized labor of the small-scale peasant and artisan producers lay in the face that the means lay in the fact that the means of labor was made available to them notwithstanding that they were dependent on the lords who owned the land. The individual production proceeded on the lines of a division of labor within the economic framework of the medieval manner. In the undivided possession of their physical and mental capabilities and left to the freedom of their inventiveness for the sake of lightening their work, these small-scale producers achieved an enormous increase of productive capacity through the massive utilization of the natural forces of water, wind, and beasts of burden. The drought power of horse and ox was revolutionized by the invention of the breast strap harness, making possible the use of the heavy plow stirrup and iron horseshoes were developed and means of transport increased and improved so as to bring corn wood wool dyers woad etc to the water mills and later to the windmills for processing these mills were used in a multitude of ways and were connected with the invention and improvement of new tools and methods of work no room is available here for the relevant and interesting details. A good indication of the development, however, is contained in the Domesday Book of 1086, which enumerates no fewer than 5,624 watermills south of the Trent and Severn. Of outstanding importance for subsequent developments was the progress in animal rearing and particularly of sheep breeding for wool processing. This general growth of the productive forces available to the individual peasants and artisans between the 9th and 13th centuries gave rise to a change in the mode of feudal exploitation. The appropriation of the surplus assumed forms which, while more successful in enriching the feudal exploiter, were at the same time more apt to give greater mobility and scope of initiative to the exploited. It was the era of the formation of towns and of growing expansion of monetary relationships. It was followed in the next two centuries by a mounting trend towards the emancipation of economic developments from the tentacles of feudalism. In the words of Rodney Hilton, the history of the English agrarian economy in the 14th and 15th centuries illustrates very well the consequences of successful peasant resistance to the Lord's pressure for a transfer of surplus. In fact, it must be regarded as a critical turning point in the history of the prime mover of the social change in progress. The long period of the successful and multiform exploitation of peasant labor ended, at any rate in most Western European countries, between the middle and the end of the 14th century. However, the era of a free peasant and artisan economy was not long lived. It did not survive the 15th century. To the degree to which the emancipation succeeded, the direct producers retained their technical independence of choosing what and how to produce, but by no means their freedom from economic exploitation. They exchanged the bonds of feudal tyranny for the entangle entanglement of the ever-tightening net of the merchants and usurers' capital. Again, to quote Rodney Hilton, 
Moneyed wealth, which was not based on the possession of landed property, came from trade, which was in the hands of monopoly companies of merchants like the merchant ad adventurers and the merchants of the stable. The developments described here with special, although by no means exclusive, reference to England took place much earlier in Flanders and Italy, particularly in Florence, which is, of course, of primary importance from our point of view. In the 13th century, the struggle for urban independence and emancipation from the forces of rural feudalism was led everywhere by merchant capitalists and bankers. But in the towns, this went hand in hand with the growing exploitation and impoverishment of the producers, whose character as artisans gradually deteriorated to that of mere, of mere cottage laborers. Feudalism has grown out of the declining Roman economy. Now the rise of merchant capital led to the revival of a monetary economy, thereby linking up, so to speak, with the point where the economy of antiquity had given up. Proof of this is found in many places, but nowhere with greater clarity than in England. Here, around AD 900, monetary economy had already begun, not as a result of such pervasive trade relations as that of Italy with Byzantium and the Levant, but for the very different and more local reason that the Danes, on their second invasion of England's east coast, had imposed upon the king the payment of a tribute in money. As a consequence, the king was forced to establish a monetary accountancy. By the 12th century, one finds detailed instructions for the running of the royal exchequer and the collection of tax and cash, thereby enforcing monetary thinking upon the taxpayer. Some 200 years later, in Oxford, manuals were compiled with exact and varied material for teaching bailiffs, reeves, accountants, and other administrators of feudal domains from the perspective of loss and gain. These have recently been published in an admirably painstaking edition by Dorothea Oshinsky under the title Walter of Henley and Other Treatises on Estate Management and Accounting. The earliest of these texts is by Robert Gross Grosstest, who died in 1253, Bishop of Lincoln, Bishop of Lincoln, Bishop of Lincoln, who, advise, who advises the Countess of Lincoln on how to make bigger gains and fewer losses on her very numerous manorial estates. In 1214, the same Grosseteste became the first chancellor of the Colleges of Oxford and thus founder of the university. His significant achievement as an academic made him the earliest in that succession of great Oxford scholastics whom one might even call English Aristotelians, including such names as Roger Bacon, Dunce Scotus, Thomas Bradwardine, and William of Ockham. These scholastics maintained a constant exchange of ideas and comings and goings between Oxford and Paris. The close ties between the monetary and the scholastic developments are obscured by a peculiar state of affairs. The educational books for the profitable administration of feudal estates had to be written in the French of that time instead of in Latin so as to be understood by the Norman overlords, and for this reason were excluded from the records of the university, although this whole branch of teaching took place in Oxford. The historians of the university know nothing of it. And in most cases, it is not even known who were the authors of the manuals. But scholasticism's connection with its economic background can be recognized on quite a different level. From the perspective of money on the one hand, and from that of labor and production on the other. The first new mathematical developments took place from 1202 onwards when Leonardo de Pisa published his Liber Abbasi. This innovation in mathematics was again associated with a change of implementation. The Greeks excelled in geometry, but not in arithmetic and algebra, although they possessed and used the abacus. The Indians, the Chinese, and later the Arabians combined the technique of the abacus with a rational numerical notation, which took them far ahead of classical antiquity. About Leonardo of Pisa's 
Liber Abaci, Moritz Cantor writes, Despite its total mathematical clarity and discipline, it was off-puttingly difficult. On the other hand, it dealt with things which the merchant could use in the demands of daily life and sometimes had to. Cantor tells how Leonardo's father, himself a merchant of Pisa, demanded that his son devote several days to the study of the Abacus. He was introduced to this discipline by the help of the Indians' nine numerals, found pleasure in it, and on trade journeys which he later undertook to Egypt, Syria, Greece, Sicily, and Provence, learned everything there was to know about this practice of counting. But this everything, together with algorithm and the segments of Pictor Pictagoras, seemed to me as so many errors compared with the method of the Indians. And he had specialized in the Indian method, added things of his own, enriched the geometrical art of Euclid, or Euclid, Euclid, by new subtleties and so published this work in 15 sections. Also that the race of Latins, meaning the Italians, should no longer be found ignorant in these matters. The demands of daily life of the merchants was that of greater international trade, which at the time of the Crusades joined together European feudalism with the Arabian and Byzantine empires. It was a trade for which Leonardo and others taught methods of calculating the purity content of precious precious metals, since the international standard coins, such as the gold florin, the ducat, the sequin, and the gilder, went into circulation only when feudal domination had collapsed after the death of Frederick II in 1250. From that date, the independence and rise of the towns depended only on the towns themselves and on their inter internecine rivalries. This dating may be too precise since the developments depended on the uneven progress, not only between north and south, but more important, of the manufacture of cloth, the principal commodity of international trade. Centered in Flanders and northern Italy on the one hand, and the wool-producing countries of England, Spain, France, and Saxony on the other. By 1350, a hundred years later, the commercial activities of merchant capital had already developed so extensively that the production relations were rapidly changing. The supplying countries, and particularly England, began their own cloth manufacture. Up to then, the Italian and Flemish buyers, for example, had negotiated most of the wool deliveries with the domain managements. Now, however, the greater part of the wool supplies was contracted by individual direct producers who gained their independence from the domains, enlarged their flock of sheep, and began to enjoy a growing monetary income, the feudal lords leasing them the necessary pasture land. In England, wool became the commercial equivalent for money, and Edward III frequently accepted tax payments in wool in lieu of money. Hence the wool sack of Parliament. The historical events leading to the later Enclosure Acts date back to this time. There occurred the transference of moneyed wealth to a growing middle class of agrarian and artisan stock, who themselves had changed from the laborers employed by feudalism to employers of laborers producing for merchant capital. Um, the end of the 14th century sees the transition from artisan modes of production to the pre-capitalist epoch, the epoch of the Renaissance, with which the history of the development of natural science begins. Here are the development moving in a diametrically opposite direction to ancient commodity production, of which we spoke at the opening of this chapter, started to take shape. Whereas the originally social character of labor with which human history begins reached the point of absolute dissolution in the decline of the Roman Empire when its slave economy changed to feudalism, now, as medieval feudalism ends, the trend of renewed cooperation of labor in production occurs under the impact of the merchant capitalist developments. This trend inaugurates the epoch of pre-capitalism from around 1300 onwards until two and a half or three centuries later, the situation is rife for merchant capitalism to turn into production capitalism. That is to say, into capitalism proper. 
but the important difference of the renewal of the socialization of labor from its primitive counterpart is that the modern form feeds entirely on the resources and incentives of the second nature and no longer on those of primary nature. It no longer depends on the standards and the capacities of the direct material interchange of man with nature, but on the subordination of labor to capital. Chapter 17. <clears throat> the forms of transition from artisanry to science. Medieval handicraft began with the personal unity of head and hand. Galilean science established their clear-cut division. In this chapter, we are concerned with the transition from artisanry to science from this viewpoint. The causes of the transformation can be found in the change from one man production to production on an ever increasing social scale. This occurred, as we have seen, mainly as a result of the commercial revolution. The formation of towns as urban communities started in the era of late feudalism. With their development sprang the need for communal walls, communal defenses, communal town halls, cathedrals, roads and bridges, water supplies and drainage systems, harbor installations and river control, monuments, and so on. These were all due to the activities of capital, commercial and monetary, antediluvian anti forms of capital, as Marx calls them. The social character of all this development is the direct outcome and manifestation of the originally social power of capital. Under this power, the great mass of the artisans were ruthlessly exploited. They still retain the status of producers owning their own means of production, but the bulk of them did so as impoverished cottage laborers, hopelessly indebted to the capitalists for whom they produced the merchandise. They were downgraded and depressed to the standard of proletarian labor long before they actually assumed the status of mere wage laborers. Production taking place in artisan workshops, on the other hand, increased in volume and changed in labor methods. The employment of more and more semi-skilled workers resulted in class divisions within the workshops. From our viewpoint, however, these economic and sociological changes are not the main focus of interest. They are not the ones that can explain the logical and historical steps leading to the formation of science. Parallel to the economic developments making for the eventual dissolution of the artisan mode of production go technological changes <laughs> caused by the increasingly social scale of the order of life as a whole exemplified by the town developments. Construction and production tasks of such dimensions and novelty stretch the craftsmen to the limits of their resources and inventiveness. By the necessity to tackle the problems, there rose from the ranks of ordinary producers the great Renaissance craftsmen, the experimenting masters. artists, architects, and also engineers of the 15th and 16th centuries. The main qualification which the craftsmen lacked in their capacity as artisans for solving the problems facing them can be named in one word, mathematics. We have defined mathematics as the logic of socialized thought. Capital and mathematics correlate. The one wields its influence in the fields of economy, the other rules the intellectual powers of social production. We must be clear about the limits that are set to the capacity of work tied to the personal unity of head and hand. The artisan or individual manual worker masters his production, not through abstract knowledge, but by practical know-how and by the expertise of his hands. In terms of knowledge, it is the knowledge of how one does, not of how one explains things. This practical knowledge can be conveyed by demonstration, repetition or words, depending on practical understanding of the task involved. Cookery books are a clear example. This is moreover not only true of human functions. Let us suppose we deal with a working, with working a pump, a threshing flail, or a watermill, irrespective of whether they, they replace human labor or whether man cannot perform their task. In speaking to manual workers, one cannot express oneself in any other way than by treating these things as if they took the part of human agents. The language of common usage, devoid of special technical terms, cannot articulate a division of intellectual and manual labor. 
The only symbol language which rends itself free from this tie-up with human activity is that of mathematics. Mathematics cuts a deep cleft between a context of thought and human action, establishing an unambiguous division of head and hand in the production of processes. It is no exaggeration to say that one can measure the extent of division of head and hand by the inroad of mathematics at any particular task. More than any other single phenomenon, it was the development of firearms which imposed the use of mathematics on artisanry. Needless to say, the technology of firearms did not cause the dialectic of the pre-capitalist development, but from the second half of the 15th century, it intensified and accelerated technological developments enormously. The use of firearms was confined to guns for artillery, and in this capacity created problems completely new and alien to artisan experience and practice. Problems such as the relationship between the explosive force and the weight of cannon and range of fire, between the length, thickness, and material of the barrel, between the angle and the resulting path of fire, Metal casting assumed new proportions, as did the mining of ore, the demands of transport, and so on. Special importance accrued to military architecture for the defense of cities and harbors. From the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453, well into the 16th and even 17th century, the Turkish menace hung over Europe like a nightmare. After the fall of Otranto in the Adriatic in 1490, Venice felt under the threat of immediate assault, and in 1532 the Turks laid siege to Vienna. To gauge the strain and stresses which the urgency of this turn of events laid upon European artisanry would demand a study beyond our scope. We can, however, gain an illuminating insight into the contradictions of the epoch by drawing upon the writings of Albrecht Dürer as a master in both the arts and mathematics. My remarks are based on instructions of measurement with compass and ruler, and on the instruction as to the fortification of town, castle, and hamlet. Here the unique attempt is made to refashion mathematics to make it a fitting discipline for the use of artisanry. This means, of course, to attempt the impossible. Nevertheless, his venture was so significant that it occupied mathematicians and military architects of the whole of the 16th century, and to some extent up to the 18th century. Durer had studied mathematics at the highest academic level of that time with his learned friends in Nuremberg, Willibald Perkheimer and Johann Werner. Instead, however, of using this knowledge in its scholarly form, he endeavored to put it to the advantage of the craftsmen. The work is dedicated to the young workers and all those with no one to instruct them truthfully. It aims to change geometry by modifying its implements. He replaces the ruler by the set square and alters the use of the compass by restricting it to a fixed aperture. According to generally accepted surmise, Durer, for this, drew on the tradition of workshop practice, and in particular of that of the Mason Lodges. What is novel in his method is that it tries to combine workmen's practice with Euclidean geometry, and to reconcile these two seemingly incompatible elements by aiming at nothing more than approximate results sufficient for practical needs. He writes, He who desires greater accuracy, let him do it demonstrative, not mechanist as I do it. As Moritz Cantor points out, Albrecht Dürer is the first to apply the principle of approximation with full awareness. Only in his construction of the Pentagon does Durer neglect this distinction, presumably because he takes it to be accurate, albeit erroneously. The fact that he otherwise makes such a clear distinction between what is correct and what is of practical use places him on a plane of science reached by hardly any other geom ge geometrician of the 16th century. On the subject of Durer's construction of the Pentagon, Leonardo Olschke writes, the construction of the regular pentagon by this method, the fixed compass aperture, exercised the wits of such mathematicians as Tartaglia, Cardano, G. Del Monte, Benedetti, and others, until finally P. A. Cataldi devoted a special dissertation on it which appeared in Bologna in 1570. 
He was a member of the Florentine Academia del Diseño, where 20 years later Galileo also taught. Galileo too dealt with Durer's construction in his lectures on military architecture of 1592 to 93, and even Kepler in his Harmon Harmonices Mundi still discussed Durer's construction of the Septagon. What Durer had in mind is plain to see. The builders, metal workers, etc. should, on the one hand, be enabled to master the tasks of military and civil technology and architecture, which far exceeded their traditional training. On the other hand, the required mathematicians should serve them as a means, so to speak, of preserving the unity of head and hand. They should benefit by the indispensable advantages of mathematics without becoming mathematical brain workers themselves. They should practice socialized thinking and yet remain individual producers. And so he offered them an artisan's schooling in drugmanship, permeated through and through with mathematics, not to be confused in any way with applied mathematics. Nothing can illustrate the inner par paradox of the pre-capitalist mode of production more clearly than, than this attempt of Durer's. Nothing can so eliminate the interrelationship of the intellectual form of development with the economics of the condition of production than its fate. It met with failure on both counts. To do justice to the inner nature of this achievement of Durer is impossible here. Two or three quotations must suffice to illustrate it. His stereometric constructions in the fourth book of the instructions of measurement end. Here I have drawn up everything quite openly after which I closed it, laid it on the ground and opened it up once more. In numerous constructions, he points out ways in which they could prove useful to his workmates. Here, for instance, with the doubting or with the doubling of the cube. In this way, they could duplicate, triplicate, and infinite, infinitely increase and augment the cube and all other things. Now as such, an art is of great use and serves the end of all workmen, but is held by all the learned in the greatest secrecy and concealment. I propose to put it to the light and teach it abroad. For with this art, firearms and bells can be cast barrels, chests, gauges, wheels, rooms, pictures, and what you will, enlarged. Thus let every workman heed my words, for they have never, to my knowledge, been given in the German language before this day. From the squaring of circle, mechanis, that is approximately, so that at work it will fall short of nothing or of very little, and could be put by comparison as follows. Regarding approximation, now I shall change a previous triangle into a septangle through a common trick, which we need to speed up a job of work. But in fact, Durer's intentions came to nothing because he demanded far too much in the way of mathematical understanding from the apprentices and craftsmen of his time, despite all the painstaking efforts he had taken to be sufficiently explanatory. Moreover, his aims to save the unity of head and hand were frustrated by the response that his writings evoked from the subsequent mathematician mentioned above. Or mathematicians mentioned above. They never considered, for instance, the geometry of fixed compass aperture as a means of helping craftsmen. Their main effort was directed towards demonstrating that this geometry could cope with the entire body of the Euclidean geometry, its principles, theorems, problems, and all. Hence, Durer's was not a particular artisan geometry. Indeed, such a geometry does not exist and cannot be invented. This reestablishment of mathematics as the dividing line between head and hand is all the more conclusive as Tartaglia himself copes with artisan problems. In his book of 1537 and the first eight books of the second one of 1546, as well as in a number of his Risposti replies, to Ferrari, he deals with questions of ballistics, harbor fortification, and cannon casting, which the highly skilled craftsmen of the Venice arsenals had put to him as their mathematical consultant. And in parts of his own work, Tartaglia also uses the geometry of fixed compass aperture. In his case, it is as, di as difficult as endures to be sure where this geometry atta attracting such wide interest throughout the 16th century had its origin. 
The most likely assumption is that it answered the requirements of the Venetian craftsmen as the durers did the demands of those of Nuremberg. Tartaglia, however, charged a fee to the workmen for the answers he gave them. Indeed, it was the main source of his living and showed no sign of wanting to bolster up their education. Tartaglia and his pupil Benedetti and their enemies Cardano and Ferrari, as well as Caval Cavalieri and other Italian mathematicians of the 16th century, already trod upon early capitalist ground. They worked for the steady deepening of the cleavage between head and hand and groped towards the science whose methodological, si uh, methodological basis is the completed severance of the one from the other.